Hello. Uh, today I'm going to uh, begin a series of talks on the geology of Iceland. And these talks are meant to be for everyone. So I do not assume any geological background. These are meant to be understood by everyone who is interested in knowing a little bit about the geology of Iceland. Iceland has a lot of opportunities for people to understand geological processes. So I hope that uh, by going through these uh, talks I will give uh, in, in the coming weeks, you will learn something about geological processes in general, with application, of course, to, to Iceland. So Iceland is absolutely a unique place to observe and understand active geological processes. These processes shape our planet. And here I show you in A, B, C, D, E, F, some of the things we are going to look at during these talks. So in A, we have a lava pile in a mountain of in the mountain of Asia, close to Reykjavik. In B, we have the spectacular fractures, tectonic fractures, earthquake fractures uh, in Thingredli, close to Reykjavik as well. And of course, you see the volcano Hengitlia close by. In C, again at Thingredli, we see a tectonic fracture pure opening fracture, pure tension fracture here, filled with water. In D, we see an erupting geyser. In E, we see the spectacular, beautiful waterfall of Gullfoss, the golden waterfall. And in F, we see an explosion crater, or more accurately, uh, a crater that is formed by subsidence, and I'll discuss that later on. We also see parts of the older areas of Iceland in the vicinity of Reykjavik, namely in A, a frozen magma filled fracture. You see the lady here standing for scale. So the frozen magma filled fracture here is what we call a dike. So nearly all volcanic eruptions in the world are supplied with magma through dikes. So they are very important in understanding the conditions for volcanic eruptions. In B, we see the typical situation in Iceland, in the rift zone of Iceland. This again is in the southwest Iceland, I think close to Thingredli. But this is also what characterizes the mid-ocean ridges everywhere in the world. These are big fractures we call faults, normal faults to be more specific, where one side, this one here has subsided, and this one may have risen a little bit in, in, in an earthquake episode. In C, we see a real explosion craters on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And in D, we see what is referred to for, for the tourists as the bridge between the two continents, where the plates are supposed to move apart in Iceland. This, of course, is an idealization. Uh, it's not exactly there, but it is a very big tension fracture, the fracture opened by pure, pure tension, pure plate tectonic forces. And you see a person here for scale. In E, we see one of the best known landmarks in Iceland, the Skoafoss waterfall in southern Iceland. We go there later in these talks. And similarly, in F, we see the beautiful columns or the cooling joints or columnar joints in the Rainesfjara in southern Iceland, which we will also visit later in these talks. So let's move on. And of course, we have volcanic eruptions in Iceland. On average, there's an eruption every four to five years. And this one shows 
uh, an early state of the eruption in central Iceland in Bárðarbunga, close to the Vatnajökull Icy, in 2014 to 2015. Yes, we surely have volcanic eruptions in Iceland. And we also have earthquakes. This photo shows a house, house for animals, that was ruptured by an earthquake propagation in the year 2000, in fact, in June 2000. And here we see nicely the upper part of the house has shifted to the right and the lower part to the left. So this is a fault, is an earthquake fracture fault that has propagated, has gone through the house during the magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquakes in the year 2000 in Iceland. So here is an overview of the area, the southern and southwestern part of Iceland that I will cover in these talks. Show occasional photographs from all the parts of Iceland, but the main focus is in this part here, the southern, where we have famous volcanoes like Eyjafjallajökull and Jökull and Katla, and the Reynisfjara column, not joints, and so on. Westmanaya here, the islands off, offshore of Iceland. And then we have the golden circle in this area here. The golden circle will be covered. And then we will make extra excursions or extra talks on the area here in Kvalfjörður, the fjord Kvalfjörður, and the Reykjanes Peninsula, Hengit, and, and some other areas. The focus is on this famous golden circle. But most people enter Iceland at the Keflavik airport, which is here. And then they drive to Reykjavik, the capital. So I will, in this first talk, I will focus on this area here to tell you what we can see out of the bus, out of the taxi or your private car, or however you are traveling from Keflavik to, to Reykjavik, and compare with other parts, other similar structures in Iceland to ex explain this in detail. Nearly all the structures we will see here will be discussed in more detail later in these talks. So that's the famous golden circle uh, going from Reykjavik through all the rocks here to Thingvelli, the rift zone and the famous lake, uh, Thingvellava. The center of volcano Hingit here, the main volcano Hingit here is located there. Then one continues to the erupting geysers and to the waterfalls and then back to Reykjavik. Now, as you see, obviously here, the golden circle <laughs> is not really a circle. It's more like an irregular triangle, but that doesn't matter. We will uh, focus on it as the famous golden, golden circle. So we see all these big fractures in Thingredli, the erupting geyser in geyser, the geyser area and the waterfall of Gullfoss and, and so on. There are two books for the general public on exactly the, le the lectures or the talks I will give here. Uh, one in English, The Glorious Geology of Iceland Golden Circle and the, the other one is uh, translated in, into German. They cover the, the same, same thing uh, and uh, show the golden circle and the surrounding and the surrounding areas. Now these are for the general public. They do not require any geological background or knowledge. And then there are more, more technical books for those who are, who are interested in, in understanding the, the processes in, in greater depth as so geology students or, or, or professional scientists. One is on the fractures themselves, how they form and propagate. And the other one, uh, that one is called rock fractures and geological processes. The other one is on volcanism in general on this planet, but shows of course many examples from volcanis, volcanism and volcanic activity in Iceland. So these are, these are technical books. The other two are for the general, general reader. So Iceland is not a large country. The 
total area is around 103,000 square kilometers. So it's a little bit larger than Ireland or around one third of the area of Germany, for example. As I told you, we focus on the south, southern and southwestern part of Iceland for the simple reason most people who visit Iceland, they go into these areas. And in addition, all the main processes in Iceland, all the main geological processes in Iceland can really be seen in those areas. We have yellow is the active volcanic zone, Reykjavik is here. So Reykjavik is not in, inside an active volcanic zone, it's, it's just outside, some, some tens of kilometers outside the active volcanic zones. And inside these yellow active volcanic zones, there are specific volcanic systems, and I'll explain them a little bit better later on. Those are often, but not always, with a big volcano in the center, like here, Hengit. Uh, but some of them, like the other systems on the Reykjans Peninsula, do not have any particular major volcano, volcanic center or central volcanoes, we call them. Then there's a seismic activity, earthquake activity, particularly here in the South Iceland seismic zones. That includes the largest or generates the largest earthquakes in Iceland, together with the zone here in Northern Iceland that is outside our scope, called the Jernus, Jernus Fracture Zone. This one here. So there are two volcanic zones in southern Iceland and one in the north. And we will discuss this area. I show here some of the famous landmarks uh, in, in southern Iceland that we discuss. Thingredlir, Geysir, the volcano Hekla, the volcano Hingit, the volcanoes Eyjafjallajökull, Jökull, and Katla, and so on and so forth. So let's move on. Why does Iceland exist? Why is this island here? Why is it geologically so active? Why are there so many volcanoes, geothermal fields, and large earthquake fractures? Iceland exists geologically for two main reasons. The first one is that Iceland is a part of a spreading or, or opening, opening mid-ocean ridge, namely the mid-Atlantic ridge. The spreading, the movement of the tectonic plates generates earthquakes or earthquake fractures, including those that conduct geothermal fluids and give rise to the uh, erupting geysers and the hot springs. And the spreading also allows the vol volcanic activity to take place and the volcanoes to build up. So I have here on the left hand side a very schematic old illustration from the National Geographic showing you uh, crudely uh, the mid Atlantic ridge and Iceland there. And we see in this map very nicely that Iceland stands above the surrounding mid ocean ridge. So it's not just that Iceland is located on the Mid-Ocean Ridge. If it were, if that was the only reason for Iceland's existence, then Iceland simply would not exist. It would be a part of the oceanic floor at 1,000, 2,000 meters depth and, and the seawater. I show you also here the, some of the consequence of lifting the earthquake fractures in Thingvellir and a very old illustration of the basics of plate movements. I illustrate here schematically the mid-Atlantic ridge and, and this so-called subduction zone where the plates go down into the mantle again. So as I say, if it was just a mid-Atlantic ridge here, then Iceland should be really not an island, but part of the sea bottom. So the other reason why it exists is a mantle plume, a mantle plume, the Iceland mantle plume. Now, what is a mantle plume? It is basically a hot part of the mantle that rises towards the surface, indicated by this red kind of cylinder here, irregular cylinder, rises at 
And when it's at a shallow depth, tens of kilometers, melting takes place and that produces molten rocks or magma, which supplies magma to eruptions in Iceland and is the main reason Iceland exists above sea level. So the center of the Icelandic mantle plume is somewhere under the largest ice sheet in Iceland, the Vatnajökull here, and it has been traced by seismic methods down to three, four hundred kilometers. But in reality, mantle plumes are quite common on the, on the planet, and they originate not at three, four hundred kilometers depth, they originate probably at 2,900 kilometers depth, namely at the boundary between the outer core, which is molten, and the lower mantle, which is not mol molten, but basically plastic, as it can, or duct, it can move over periods of, of, of time. So that's where they originate, hot material, rising towards the surface, like in Hawaii, Afa, Reunion, and Iceland, of course, and generate volcanism. So Hawaii and Iceland are both the consequence of a mantle plume, of a mantle plume. Now, because Iceland is located at a mid-ocean ridge, it is what we call uh, a consequence of a divergent plate boundary. So divergent plate boundary means simply a, a plate boundary, bound, boundary between the tectonic plates that constitute the surface of the earth, where the plates are moving apart, away from each other. That's what we call a divergent plate boundary. Uh, that's indicated by the black arrows here. And that means there is a spreading, there is a movement spreading of the order of 1.8 centimeter per year. So this is a slow spreading area in some parts of Pacific. The spreading is 17, 18 centimeters per year, for example, East Pacific rise. So 1.8 centimeter per year is, is similar to half the rate of a fingernail growth, half as fast as a fingernail grows. So it's very, very slow, but still has in extremely important consequences. So as I say, there are two volcanic zones in the south, and one in the north. The spreading rate is slightly lower in the north and slightly higher in the, in the south, but on average around 1.8 centimeter per, per, per year. 1.8 centimeter per year. So as I said earlier, most visitors to Iceland come by aeroplanes to Keflavik, to the Keflavik airport, the main airport in Iceland. And then they drive one here to one of these towns or to Reykjavik. I indicate here by the numbers and on similar maps are numbers where there is an interesting location and often show photos of things you can see from these numbers. But in my talk, I will not specify those numbers but in the books I indicated to you, these pop popular or general books, uh, I, I indicate those, those numbers. So on the way from Keblavik to uh, Reykjavik, we have a lot of tectonic and volcanic features to look at. So ha let's have a look at some of them uh, on the way to, to Reykjavik. The Reykjanes Peninsula, the one we are driving along, has four main volcanic systems. They're all trending or striking northwest, no, sorry, northeast, sorry, northeast. And each volcanic system is basically a gigantic fracture but mostly filled with volcanic materials. So it's a gigantic fracture. It's easiest to look at it here in the Hingid volcanic system. It's a gigantic fracture, really, filled with uh, volcanic material. And in mechanics, we call such a feature 
elastic inclusion, not intrusion, inclusion. In addition, along the Regan's Peninsula is, is a plate boundary, an oblique plate boundary, striking or, or trending roughly close to east-west, uh, slightly, slightly east-northeast, you could say, here, in this area here. So it's a plate boundary where we have regularly earthquakes. The volcanism is in the volcanic systems and the earthquakes are primarily here along the plate boundary. But of course, when there's volcanism, uh, we also have uh, earthquakes. When, when, for example, dike, a magma field fracture is propagating to the surface, it breaks the rock and causes earthquakes. So each of these volcanic systems has a magma source. And the magma sources at 10 to 15 kilometers depth here, in parts of Iceland, they're even deeper, maybe 20 kilometers depth. They are called magma reservoirs. Now, they are not filled with magma. They are partially molten. So they are, they are little pores, little holes in the, in, in the rock or in the, in the mantle rock there that are filled with magma. This is not a, a just, a, just magma. It's also crystals and, 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 uh, and other solid particles. So from these reservoirs, occasionally, dye, like the red one here, is able to propagate to the surface. A magma field fracture is able to propagate to the surface. And some of the volcanic systems, only one in the Regan's Peninsula, have in addition to these deep-seated reservoirs, have shallow magma chambers. The shallow magma chambers in, on the Regan's Peninsula is only in, in the Hengit volcano. If we have a shallow magma chamber, that chamber usually generates a major volcano like Hengit within the volcanic system. The shallow chamber is usually, as the name implies, quite shallow, maybe with a roof at one to five kilometers depth. Whereas, as I said, the reservoir roof is at 10, 15, or even 20, 20 kilometers depth or, or deeper in, in parts of Iceland. So what do we see on the way from Keplavik to Reykjavik? Well, we see a lot of fractures. Yes, this one is taken from an aircraft. So you see the fractures better because you can see them from the road. And the fractures are mainly of two types. They are faults, like you see here in the center, a fault where one side of the rock has fallen down, and the other may, may have become uplifted the party. So the, the subsidence in this case here is on the left, on the left hand side of, of the fault of the fault of the fracture. This is what we call a normal fault. Then we have tension fracture. Tension fracture is just pure opening, no displacement laterally or vertically, just pure opening. And tension factors are always very shallow. They don't go deep into the crust. They are limited to the uppermost few hundred meters. We'll talk about this much more later on. But let's move on here because we can see a, a, a even more beautiful example here. So this is an ideal normal fault, really, an ideal normal fault because we see here the maximum subsidence or what we call vertical displacement, the maximum vertical displacement is in the center, is in the center. So the maximum vertical displacement is in the center, namely here, and, and then decreases or diminishes to the lateral ends where it changes into a tension factor. You see that here, and you see that here. But in the center is the maximum displacement, as we call it, or, or movement, is, is in the center of the normal fault. So normal faults 
are typical of, of areas of spreading divergent plate boundaries or mid-ocean ridges where the crust is moving apart. And I indicate here schematically the spreading arrows. So this fault is a consequence, direct consequence of spreading. Of course, when it's formed, when it's formed, it generates an earthquake. When the movement occurred, it generates an earthquake. And most of these larger faults like this one are not formed in a single earthquake, but in several earthquakes. Closer to Reykjavik, we see a beautifully cone-shaped mountain called Kale. This is a hyaloclastite cone, a hyaloclastite cone. Hyaloclastite mountains are very common in Iceland and on the oceanic floor. They form underwater. They form underwater. The water can be meltwater in a glacier during the last ice age, or possibly eruptions in the sea or a deep lake, it's possible as well, but definitely in, in the sea as we, we, we have seen in Iceland uh, relatively recently. At the bottom, of, or the lowermost part of high Lacastad mountains is composed of very strange lava flows that we call pillow lavas. They are generally of, of basalt in composition and, and have pillow-like structures, as we see here. I will talk about pillow lavas later on in, in the later talks when we go uh, to the rift zone in southwest Iceland. But where my notebook is here, this yellow one, the notebook is here, you can see roughly the size of the pillows. The notebooks are on 20, 20 centimeters in, 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 in May. Hyaloclastic mountains, as I said, form either during melting of a glacier when the eruption happens under a glacier and, and the heat from the magma melts through the glacier and forms a little lake inside the glacier, and there the hyaloclastic can form. It's very common. Or it can form in the sea. And here we have an example. In, uh, in, in the formation of the island of Surtse, this little island here formed in an eruption in 1963 to 67, offshore southern Iceland. This is the south coast of Iceland. It's one of the glaciers here. And this is Vestmanea, the islands offshore Iceland. So this was a new island that formed in 1963 to 1967 and is composed largely of hyaloclastite, but also some lava flows on top of it, some lava flows on, on top of the hyaloclastites, as you see here. But then in addition, hyaloclastites, both cones and ridges, form during eruptions under the glacier, like here in 1996, this is so-called the Gulf eruption in 1996. And we see the early states of the eruption where the melting has not completed, so there is just subsidence here in the ice. This is the ice covered partly with, with ash. And this is, of course, the, the smoke from the eruption, the, the eruption column. And, uh, uh, and fractures here. Later on, this eruption melted completely through the glacier, around four to 600 meter thick glacier and formed a lake, elongated lake, and inside the, that lake, there was a, a formation of, of hyaloclastite. So it formed a hyaloclastite ridge, and you will see many of those in later parts of my, my talks. Another thing, another structure you see is a tumulus. Tumulus are, are, are hillocks, small hills, formed in Pahoehoe, that's a smooth surface. There are two types of lava flows, Aa and Pahoehoe. Aa has a very rough surface, uh, difficult to walk on, hence the name from Hawaii, Aa, I, I, O, O. And the other one has a smooth surface like this one, is a Pahoehoe. 
The main difference is, is in composition. The Pahoe Hoi have higher temperature, more olivine and, and so-called primitive composition, whereas Pahoe Hoi, sorry, the, the RR flow has a, has a rough surface and often more evolved uh, composition, more, more silica content. So when the surface of the Pahoe Hoi lava flow in a depression solidifies, and lava continues to flow into that depression under the surface, it will lift up the surface and form these hills. So here we see two tumuli, this one and that one, at the surface. And later on in these talks, we will see a cross section. And I'll just show you the cross section here because it's on the Reykjanes Peninsula as well. We see a cross section through our tumulus here on the Reykjanes Peninsula. We've talked about this in, in a later talk. But you see the tumulus is several meters thick. Uh, see the person for scale. And the reason it forms is that the lava flows into the depression under the solidified surface crust and the crust dome so becomes uplifted and the lava continues to flow in and then solidifies and forms this kind of ellipsoid, uh, ellipsoid structure or ellipsoidal structure like we, we see here. So this is a tumulus. Now we come to Reykjavik. Now most people would think Reykjavik doesn't have much to show geologically because of course it's an urban area, but there are some, some interesting things there that we could have a quick look at. First of all, the name of course, the wick of the smokes, where smoke means the steam from hot springs indicates there's geothermal activity in Reykjavik. And why? Why is the geothermal activity? Well, the reason is mainly that Reykjavik is partly located inside an extinct dead volcano called the Vide volcano. This was active around 2.8 million years ago and for several hundreds of thousands of years and became extinct, died out around 2 million years ago. But the rocks it generated are still hot and they pro produce hot water, so the heat from the still warm rocks is the heat source for the geothermal uh, fields in, in Reykjavik. This volcano, the Vede volcano, collapsed, subsided on, along a ring-shaped fracture, that we call a ring fault, to form a collapsed caldera late in its evolution. And this caldera is, is roughly located here. There's some of these islands that are intrusions in, 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 in inside the caldera. So part of Reykjavik is inside a collapsed caldera, but Reykjavik is not an active, volcanically active area at all. It's not. So I will discuss more about collapsed caldera in a later talk, but it, basically is when there is an eruption, not necessarily an eruption, but often an eruption happens and a ring fracture, so half of it here, only half of it here, a ring fracture forms and the piston, the piece of land inside the ring fracture subsides into the shallow magma chamber and presses out more and more magma and therefore can subside quite much. Often these Collapse called that as worldwide have a subsidence of uh, one or even two or more kilometers here. So it subsides into the magma chamber and squeezes out the magma at the same time. Here is the best known and best exposed example of a collapse caldera in Iceland today. That is the Aska caldera in the central part of Iceland. This one here formed around eight. 8,000 years ago, six to 8,000 years ago. And then inside that caldera, another one formed in an eruption around 120 years ago. Uh, that is Lake Öskjöva, Lake Öskjöva. That formed, formed in an eruption that in fact, uh, the eruption was not very long, long lasting, but the subsidence seemed to have taken a long time. But at that time, there were very few people 
uh, no one of course lives in this area and there were very very few people to to monitor or observe these things and of course we didn't have any any high-tech uh, scientific instruments so it's not very very well known but anyway uh, these are two cold eras in central part of Iceland one very young the lake Askiva and the other one many thousand years old and is called Askia. So collapse colders are very common in volcanoes. Uh, they don't form often, maybe a few times in the lifetime of a volcano, often uh, close to the end stages or temporary end states of the activity in a volcano. So in addition, much, much younger, but still old, small or tiny lava seals occur in Reykjavik. One is where the famous church Hallgrimskirkja is located, this one here, this is a tiny little hill, uh, and another one is here, I will show you this one uh, on the next slide, this Öskjuhlíð and, and Skolverahot here in, 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 in Reykjavik. These are tiny lava shields. Now lava shield is what many people would call shield volcano, but shield volcano, strictly speaking, like in Hawaii and Galapagos Islands, live for a long time, for tens or hundreds of thousands of years and formed in many eruptions, whereas these lava shields, they form in a single eruption and are of course much smaller. So these are very small lava shields, this one here and that one, that one here, Öskjuhlíð, where these uh, geothermal containers are located and, and what used to be a restaurant, the Pearl, is located here on, on the top. So this is a little hill around one or two hundred thousand years old and after that there hasn't been any activity in Reykjavik except for one lava flow that came into the city some five thousand years ago and I will show you in, in a moment but I draw your attention to this mountains here. Asia we will discuss very much in our next talk and then later on we will mention these two other volcano, uh, sorry, mountains, Skarsede and Agrafjall. So all these are seen here. So the rocks here in Asia, in this part of Asia, came from the Wede volcano that I mentioned earlier. So they're around 2.8 million years old rocks here. And we discuss them both in the next talk and in later talks when we go up to the fjord quite a few here. So this is a typical shape of a lava shield. This is the most famous lava shield in Iceland called Skjaldbreiður, but of, and it's close to, to Thingvellir, or it's the north of Thingvellir. But it is, of course, many, many, many times bigger than those tiny little shields we have inside Reykjavik. And this one is young maybe 9,000 years old or something like that. Whereas the others are uh, hundreds of thousands of years old. And as I said, the last volcanic activity in relation to Reykjavik was a lava flow that came into this little valley here called Edle or Dalur, but that lava flow did not, was not erupted in Reykjavik. Reykjavik is not active. There's no volcanic activity in Reykjavik. This lava flow came from 20 kilometers away from a volcanic system on the Reykjavik Peninsula and flowed all this way into the eastern part of Reykjavik. So today, of course, that would not happen. We would divert the flow of the lava if it came out, uh, came up in, in one of the volcanic systems of the Reykjavik Peninsula or stop it all together. So, so Reykjavik absolutely is, is not volcanically active anymore. So I have now given you an overview uh, that you would kind of uh, what, what you would see if you land on the Keblavik airport and drive to, to Reykjavik. And uh, you've seen structures like earthquake fractures, hyaloclastic cones, collapse colders, and, 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 and tumuli. And in later talks, I will, I will go in more detail about many of those. The next talk, the next talk is on uh, the area from Reykjavik and to the thing with the rift zone. And here I show you uh, the spectacular fracture called Almanikau in, in the rift zone of Thingvellir. 
and also the Hengit volcano. And of course, you see the geothermal, geothermal fields here. So in the next talk, I will talk about the, the area between Reykjavik and Thingvellir, including Thingvellir. And I, I will then start the proper journey along the golden circle. So with, with the words of the golden circle, I, I, I stop this talk here now and, uh, and uh, say just to you, um, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>